welcome to episode 29 of Military Veterans Podcast, where we talk to veterans to learn about their stories and experiences. And today we're joined by Diana Soriano. Did I get that right, Diana? You did. <laughs> yes, yes. How are you doing today? I'm great. How are you, Gavin? I'm doing good, thank you. Doing good. We're back doing a remote recording uh, because you are not in the UK, so we couldn't connect up. And whereabouts are you in this lovely world? San Antonio, Texas in the United States. Brilliant stuff, brilliant stuff. Well, thank you for joining me today. Uh, it's been a while since I've done one of these remote recordings, so uh, I forgot how to set everything up in my kitchen. I don't know if that's ever been mentioned on the podcast, but there we go, I turned my kitchen into a recording studio. Um, so it's been great to connect with you, and it's been a while, hasn't it, since we actually connected uh, before this? Yeah, it has. <laughs> but how's your day been? Has your day been good so far? So far, so good. Yes, thank you for having me on the show. No problem at all. Uh, now, before we get into the four questions, um, I do want to rave about this episode. This marks the second anniversary of Military Veterans Podcast, and you are the guest that's on for it. How cool is that? <laughs> I'm so excited. <laughs> and congratulations. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's uh, I think it's doing really well. Um, and, you know, c connecting people that wouldn't connect otherwise, right? Because I would never have met you otherwise. So Absolutely. Yeah. And I think you came across the show. Uh, how did, yeah, how did you come across the show? Cause you, you, you reached out to me. Yes. So I was looking up different podcasts that were for veterans specifically sharing different experiences, personal experiences and, uh, podcasts that were real and authentic came across yours and I liked it. So I reached out. Nice one. And you reached out to me being a Brit. So, you know, there's always going to be differences between yeah. <laughs> <laughs> between I liked that stuff. It <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you for liking it and and also thank you for reaching out and as I already said, thank you for coming on and to be a guest. So, uh let's go into the four questions um and what I'll do for you uh, as we discussed uh we discussed before we got recording. I'm going to split the four questions into two segments. So, we're going to do two questions at the same time. Um and then we'll dive into the meat of the show, the main part of the show. How's that sound? Sounds good. Fantastic, fantastic. So the first two questions are, uh, when did you join and what service and branch did you join? So I joined the United States Army in June of 2008, June 25th of 2008. And I was with the AG, so Adjutant General Corps. Nice, nice. And it's kind of crazy, like you have Adjutant General's Corps you pronounce it corpse, is that right? Core, core, <laughs> sorry, I core. pronounced it wrong. <laughs> um, and so we do too, but we nickname it the AGC. So uh, it's crazy that it's a similar, well, exactly the same name, but you guys call it AG. So, AG, uh, yes. AG, nice. Um, and the next two questions are, um, how long did you serve for and what rank did you get to? So I served for 10 years and I got to the rank of Staff Sergeant. Nice, nice. That's cool. That's cool. Be great and excited to hear those 10 years and what you've done before and after. So with that in mind, uh, let's rewind. Let's all go back to the beginning. Uh, where was you born and where did you grow up? So I was born in Southern California in the Los Angeles area. Um, I grew up there, but also was moving back and forth between Las Vegas, Nevada and Los Angeles, California, because my parents were divorced and we kind of just moved back and forth between those two states. Okay. So how often would you kind of be in those states before you moved? Um, honestly, it was pretty evened out. So I know everything from my childhood by like grade because I really? moved around to so many schools. Uh -huh. And so like preschool and anything before preschool was in LA and then kindergarten to half a third grade was in Vegas moved back to LA for fourth fifth sixth seventh then half of eighth grade in Vegas another half in Colorado but that was just like a random one ninth in LA 10th and half of 11th in Vegas the other half in LA and then 12th in Vegas so it was really like evened out and kind of crazy when people are like what the heck so yeah. yeah I went to a lot of different schools that definitely prepared me for the military a lot of moving around yeah 
and also kind of crazy how you can still remember those grades and 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 Absolutely. times when it happened um so just kind of like on that did you find schooling better in one area over the other from your experience um no I can't really say that there was a huge difference I know what kind of was a little difficult was sometimes um in Vegas they were in one area of I guess the topics, for example, math, right? I was so messed up in math and this is why I kind of don't like math to this day. So I was in like pre-algebra or algebra in Vegas. And then when they moved me to LA, I got thrown into geometry in the middle of that without like, and so it kind of messed me all up and I was supposed to know certain things that I didn't know because I was still in algebra, like things like that. But for the most part, I was able to keep up. Nice. (laughs) And was you a good student? Did you did you enjoy uh, what you were learning? Uh, depended on the subject, <laughs> <laughs> but I was a good student. Uh, my mom didn't accept anything less than an A. So nice, nice. In my well, I've recently position. been looking back at my grades, and I and I got a D in most things. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> didn't I wasn't very good at school. <laughs> oh, it's all right. <laughs> um, did you enjoy sports or or anything like that whilst you're at school? Yeah, I played soccer and softball throughout my time in school. Oh, nice, nice. And it's kind of cool that, for me, it's kind of cool that you you grew up in Vegas because that's actually one of my favorite cities in the world. Uh, I, I love going back there. And no, it's not for the gambling or drinking because you can do that in any city, let's let's be honest. Um, but the the kind of like uh, the, the feeling of it and, and everything like that and the surrounding area is pretty cool. Um, I, it would have been amazing if you went to uh, a field trip with school at the Grand Canyon. I know that probably never happened, but. <laughs> and actually when we graduated, they bused us to California for a trip to Disneyland for grad night. So it's kind of crazy how that worked out. <laughs> Whoa. That is crazy. That is crazy. So um, beyond that, did you know whilst you were in school that you were potentially going to join the military? Did you have like a military family background? No, not at all. Actually, it was furthest from my mind, to be honest. Um, I always thought I was going to be a nurse. But um, I didn't have the best background growing up. I grew up in a pretty challenging and not so good um, childhood environment. And so um, when I became a senior, when I moved back from California, um, I was bouncing around from different family members, eventually moved in with my ex-boyfriend. He cheated on me with a coworker kicked me out and then I was about to be homeless. Um, And so one of the uh, groups I was in at church, I had um, a lady named Molly who kind of became my angel. Um, And she, through programs, helped me get into an extended stay hotel until I turned 18. So it was about like three or four months. Um, And then helped me get into my own apartment and helped me furnish it with her programs. So uh, I was running out of options and I couldn't play sports anymore because I had to pay rent and pay bills. So I was working two to three part time jobs after school uh, to pay for that. And so I was so determined to not turn out how my parents did and like make the wrong choices in life. And I think that's why my mom was so hard on me because she didn't want me to turn out like she did, uh, or make the same choices she did. So she pushed me a lot in school. But when I got to my senior year, that's when I'll say my, my grades started to dwindle because I was under all this stress. I was working a lot. My focus was how am I going to pay my bills this month versus what am I learning at school? Um, and I knew that's not what I wanted for my life, but I also knew I couldn't afford college to go to nursing. There was just no way. Cause I was struggling. I was living paycheck to paycheck. Um, and sometimes I had to pick between hot water or electricity. And I always chose right. electricity because most everything in my household, including the stove, was um, electric at that time. And so I took a lot of <laughs> cold showers or whatnot. But um, okay. I mean, hey, I was young, right? <laughs> <laughs> so that is kind of what caused me um, to look into the military. Um, my older brother had joined about a year or two before, and he seemed to be doing really well. Um, again, we come from a very rough upbringing and he got himself out of that and he was doing good and so we talked about it and he encouraged me and I enlisted nice was that the army for him as well is that is that the same place yes yes he was a cab scout in the army (laughs) okay okay 
I mean, that doesn't mean anything to me. Uh, I don't know what the scouting part is, but... <laughs> Combat arms. Combat arms. Okay, okay. Um, so you, you discussed it and, I mean, did you look at the potential of joining some sort of medical part within the army? Because we have that over here. I don't know if that's what you have in the States. Initially, I was looking into the Navy because <laughs> they have a really good medical program, but... I decided not to go that I wanted to be pushed. I wanted to challenge myself. Um, I was scared to join the Marines, not going to lie, because <laughs> okay. I wasn't sure if I could do it. I, was, I wasn't I was even sure if I could join the Army. I was questioning myself and my ability. Um, I was scared of basic training, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> okay. But, uh, but I ended up doing really well. Um, I had initially talked to my recruiter about being a medic, um, but unfortunately my scores, uh, when I took the ASVAB, so we had to take this test, um, to see kind of where they would put us at or what jobs, um, we would do well in or qualified for. And unfortunately I didn't score high enough the first time I took that test. And so I didn't know what to do. I originally wanted to get in as medic and my recruiter recommended becoming a 42 alpha. And I was like, I don't know what the heck that is. What's a 42 right. alpha. And it ended up being human resources. But when he was like, Oh, you'll be great at it. It's like, you're in an office. And also he didn't fully explain it. And he probably should have, but he did it. <laughs> I was just like, whatever, what's going to get me out of here soon. And so literally a week after I graduated high school, he shipped me off to boot camp. Okay. Okay. So, uh, just to confirm what, what age are you here when you're, uh, 18. when you're, you're 18. Okay. Straight and, out of uh, high school. Straight out of high school. And so you mentioned boot camp. Um, where is that? And, and is that one location for the whole of the army or do you have typically multiple locations across the, uh, across the U S? Yes. Uh, there was multiple, I think there still is multiple locations, uh, across the U S where I went to was South Carolina. South Carolina. Is that is that one of the better ones? Eh, that's the one people make fun of. <laughs> they call it relaxing Jackson, but it was not <laughs> relaxing. I don't care what people say. I had three infantry drill sergeants. So, <laughs> eh, yeah. And so you mentioned that uh, you, you found uh, boot camp. Uh, do you also call it basic training? You, you, you class yes, it as basic that as well, training. right? So basic training boot camp. That's the technical um, term for it. Yeah. Basic combat training. Got it. Got it. Okay. And then it's nicknamed boot camp. Yeah. Mm -hmm. cool cool i'm still learning like the terminology for for the u.s so it's, <laughs> it's all good um so you said you struggled a bit but how did you find it initially did it get easier as you went through it and was there anything that you were particularly good at when you when you finally got into the swing of things i was actually uh pretty scared not gonna lie when when the bus pulled up and they're like get your asses off the bus and like yelling. I'm like, what the hell did I just get myself into? Oh my gosh. I don't do well with people yelling at me. And back then I had a really, really bad attitude problem. So ah. <laughs> I was like, this is not going to go well, but I kept my mouth shut. My brother had told me like, keep your mouth shut, keep your head down. Don't bring attention to yourself. Just go through it. You'll be okay. And so I was trying to keep that in mind. Um, uh, that didn't necessarily happen. Uh, <laughs> but I, we got on the bus. They go through and they check all your bags for like um, contraband, basically, like anything that they don't want you to have. Um, and then the next day, it was really late when we got in because um, we flew, you know, cross country and all that. Um, the next day, uh, we go through and start doing like all the rotations for like medical and getting all your gear and all this stuff. And then the I think it was a third day or so we did a PT test, um, which is your, um, your athletic test, I guess. I don't know yeah, how y'all yeah. call that. Um, and so we did that. Um, and it was a one minute, everything. It was a condensed version. Usually we do like two minute, um, sit-ups, two minute push-ups, and then like your mile. And so it was a one minute of sit-ups, one minute of push-ups, and then, uh, or it was a two mile, but at that point it was a, a mile. And so one of the drill sergeants had pointed me out. She's like, she can PT. And I was like, what does that mean? Cause I didn't really know what that meant at the time. And I was nervous. I was like, I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> but, uh, because of that, um, and a few others got kind of called out too. Um, they placed me in a leadership position. Okay. and so I was a squad leader and so I was like oh, okay that was like fast you know and I got to meet my best friend at that point because she was also placed in a leadership position as a squad leader um 
and yeah, it was it was easier than I thought it would be. I was most scared of like the gas chamber. Oh yeah, okay. <laughs> Which was yeah. terrible. But uh it was I mean you get there, it wasn't I guess. Yeah, it was. It was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> but uh it cleared so, out everything, all your sinuses and all that. Yeah. It was good. Uh survived. I mean it, I, I I just, okay. I've got a question on that. So I also just realized uh I, I, I'm like 99.9% sure. I should know this 100%. But I'm pretty confident you are the first US Army person on the podcast as well. So oh. it's going to be kind of cool as well to relate between the British Army and the US Army. And you mentioning yeah. something like the gas chamber, which we did, and I guess most parts of the military do too, but I could think the Army's more kind of critical with that. Um, did you have to do things like eating drills and drinking drills whilst in the gas chamber that's what we have to do no they made us do like jumping jacks they made us recite um i think the soldier's creed so there's a creed we have to memorize and as soon as you got to like the second word you're choking and dying and they're like (laughs) okay start doing jumping jacks and i'm like oh my gosh like snot's coming out tears are coming out so you're not even wearing a gas mask (laughs) you're not even wearing a gas mask um, so they make us take it off. Oh, so first okay. you go in, you go in and you have it and they're like, okay, they're building up your confidence and all that. Then at the end to show you that your oh. gas mask works, <laughs> they make you take it off. That's so when we're in the gas mask, we're doing jumping jacks. We're doing all kinds of crap, right? Yeah. They make you take it off and then they make you say something or recite something in our, for us, we had to recite the soldier's creed. I'm telling you, uh, I got to, I am. And I started choking and like, (laughs) I was like, they're trying to kill me. Like, it's sad to say, I literally thought of like the Holocaust people. That's where my mind went. And I was like, what the heck is that? (laughs) Like, it was so bad. I felt like we were in there forever. It might've been like 30 seconds, if that, but it felt like forever. And I was dying and choking. People are crying. People are like bent over. And then all of a sudden they push you. From the back so like we're in this line and they push you and everybody starts running out of the building and you just see people like throwing up it's kind of gross it is isn't it yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. it is up and like choking and stuff. <laughs> i'm like dying my face was on fire i was just like this is terrible but then i thought after it's so was like i made it i did it you did it yeah. done <laughs> but yeah they, they, they do the same with us over here so they'll use the the tablets uh I'm trying to remember the tablets, what they're called, that, that produces the gas. I'm yeah. really having I'm having a blank here. Um, CS, yeah, maybe. CS, yeah, probably gas. CS. That's, yeah, that's what we use. Um, so uh, they would make us, they'd, they'd light all those little tablet things that, that spark spark off that gas, and then they'd get us in, in the full kit, and then they'd make us run around. So one, to get our heart rate up, two, to get a bit sweaty, Three, they blamed it on, well, we just got to move the gas around. We've got to make it as as uh, realistic <laughs> as possible. Um, and then, yeah, eating drills and drinking drills and, yeah. But, eating uh, and drinking. What is, do you have to eat something in there or something? Yeah, so they, they make us eat, like, biscuits. So you'd have oh, to, no. um, like, pretend. You go through the process that you would normally do, I guess, if you were in the real situation. So you'd, like, decontaminate the bottom part of the mask. You'd then take it off and chuck in the biscuit. And then you'd have to put the mask back on, blow out to get rid of any gas that might have uh, come into the mask, and then and then you would eat it. And then you do the same with like the the water and stuff like that. So you'd go through those those drills. Um, and then yeah, I'm pretty confident they also made us take off the mask, like you say, to make sure that we believe that the the mask is doing its job. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but yeah, there, there was there were some people that weirdly could stay in there, but they weren't affected. Did you have wow. any of those? Um, not that I recall, no. but I have heard stories <laughs> of stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Not in my, not in my platoon though. <laughs> and then when you get all sweat and stuff, it, it gets into your, into your skin even easier. Right. And therefore stings a bit and. Ugh. Yeah. Oh yeah. My skin was <laughs> on fire that day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that was a, an, uh, I get a poignant part in your basic training cause it sticks in your mind. Um, was you any good at things like uh, the shooting aspect or, or any of the other areas? Um, I kind of sucked in the beginning. I'm not going to lie because I had never shot a weapon before. Uh, but then I got good and my con- my confidence got up. And I even remember making a bet with a drill sergeant because I got, I think, like 38 out of 40 or something like that. And he was like, I bet you can't do that again. And I didn't. And then I was like, double or nothing. 
<laughs> <laughs> and so because he was like, oh, you can have like a, a cake at or something like that because we weren't supposed to have sweets, which I never did get. I, I was like too uh, scared to do any of that. Was she? But it was cool to like, m- like win the bet. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah so yeah. I was like, yeah, I'm not eating that. But um, there was that. And then I was really good at the obstacle courses. Oh, I was kind of nervous about that too, but like, because they, some of them are super tall and I, I'm scared of heights, but I learned to overcome that. And I was really good at that and rappelling. That was pretty fun. What's rappelling? Rappelling? Yeah. Okay. So you, you basically go up and there's these like tall towers and they like hook you to this, um, rope, I guess. I don't know. It's, you sit on it and it's, it like, they hold you and then you repel like both feet down the wall with a rope. Oh, okay. I d- you know I, what I'm I, talking about? No, but I, I've either <laughs> f- completely forgotten it or we don't do it over here. So if anybody yeah. listening knows that we do it in the British military, uh, you know, get in contact. Uh, <laughs> I, d- I don't think. I'll have to check it out later. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Check out some YouTube videos or something. Yeah, um, that's pretty cool. So uh, you complete training you complete that and i'm guessing that's quite a proud moment for you as you said you're a bit nervous a bit scared getting there um and how did you feel when you did complete it you know after everything has been passed i was proud i was like okay i did this i did this and then we had to go to our train our next level of training (laughs) okay so you finish you finish basic and then what you move on to uh the ag aspect or yes learning your actual job Cool. And how did you so, find that training and whereabouts was it? Um, it was also in South Carolina. So really with us, like other um, people who were in other soldiers, they kind of got bussed out or uh, taken and sent to their other locations because some people went to different states um, for their training. Um, ours happened to be there. So they just like marched us down the road, literally, and dropped us right. off. <laughs> <laughs> The training itself was pretty easy. Um, it was easy to catch on to because it, it's a lot of like uh, data entry using the system, Excel, stuff like that. So it wasn't too hard. Um, the tests were harder than the actual uh, learning because it, they're tricky questions. Like they like to trick you. Uh, There's a lot of attention to detail. But in that job, you had to have a lot of attention to detail. So it was pretty good. Um, and then again, my friend Logan, who was in basic training with me as a squad leader, she was also AG. And so we kind of got to go um, together and kind of like grow through it together. So it was pretty cool. Nice, nice. Uh, did you enjoy it more than you thought you might when you did all that the learning? Um, yeah, it, it was different, but it was cool because it's stuff that I've never done before. Before then, I'd worked in like clothing stores or like a call center for UNLV tickets and stuff. So it wasn't it was it was different. Um, it was like an actual job. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Cool. Uh, so when you complete that, do you then move on to your first unit? I guess we would call that over here. Do you say the same thing? First duty station. First duty station. Okay, okay. So you go there. Uh, so where is your your first place? My first duty station was at Fort Carson, Colorado. And my best friend Logan also got stationed at Fort Carson, Colorado. It was so rare how we like stuck together this whole time since basic training. It was pretty cool. That's cool. That's cool. Uh, and so how did you find it personally when you got there being, I guess, your first duty station? And I guess a pretty big camp right (laughs) oh yeah um it was really cold (laughs) because I got there in November and it was like snow everywhere which was really nice because I hadn't really experienced a whole lot of snow um in my upbringing upbringing so that was pretty cool um I was kind of bummed though because my brother was stationed in Fort Hood Texas and that's kind of where I wanted to go but I didn't get it so I ended up going to Fort Carson Colorado but I was also excited because I at least knew Logan was going to be there um and so it was cool it was really cold um it was kind of hard to breathe at first because you go up in elevation, but the air was so fresh. Like it's so fresh out there. It's really nice. And the scenery was really, really beautiful. So I liked that. Uh, but they were also, uh, as far as the unit goes, they were very tough. My first actual unit, they were pretty tough on us. <laughs> okay. In what, in what way? Uh, so we have this terminology called getting smoked which is basically where you are doing 
various exercises. It starts with a ton of push-ups, but then when you reach muscle failure, they go to like flutter kicks and you're kicking your feet for your abs. And like, basically it's muscle failure in different areas of your body. And so if you mess up or if you're late or anything, um, they're smoking you. And back then they used to just smoke us for anything, right? So we showed up, they smoked us just to show like, hey, like we, we're the ones in charge, you know what I mean? Okay. To show their authority. <laughs> <laughs> so that was kind of our welcome to the unit. <laughs> hold your bag up and like roll all over the floor. It was like crazy, but I was like, okay, this is what I'm getting myself into. But then the work itself and actually getting to know the NCOs and the soldiers, it was really cool. I liked them. So in your, in your role uh, that you were doing, what, what kind of stuff did you do in your first, uh, first unit? So I kind of got well-rounded uh, at my first unit uh, because our unit in particular happened to be in Iraq at the time and they were starting to come back so we were considered rear detachment um logan on the other hand their unit was gearing up to go to afghanistan so they she ended up in a different brigade um and so they were doing like a lot of training but for me um we did things like awards promotions leave uh finance and i got to do a little and mail uh, and I got to do a little bit of everything because we were kind of short staffed because most of our people were in Iraq. And so uh, I'm appreciative of that because I became very well rounded very quickly. Whereas a lot of people in my um, career field, unfortunately, only ever worked like one or two sections out of all the sections in human resources. They okay. only worked one or, or two sections their entire career. So I got right. to get a little bit of everything from the very start. And okay. that set me up for success. Very good. Very good. And so uh, in your first, I don't know, year or year and a half, maybe, uh, mm -hmm. does there anything that stood out? Was you preparing to go anywhere? Um, what, what does that look like? So I was only in my unit uh, for about six months, I say. Um, so I had met my, uh, I had met my fiance uh, who was already in his unit with it was actually logan's brigade in a defect and so um i met him through logan and her mutual friend um and so got to get to know each other um he finally said my my last name right everybody always butchers my last name right even <laughs> logan logan calls me reno because when she first met me she called me sereno so her uh, term of endearment and her nickname for me is reno so she called me reno and everybody that night we were introducing ourselves. Um, someone had butchered my last name, like always. And he caught my attention because he was like, Soriano, and like rolled the R. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, you got it right, whatever. So I met him. Um, we started talking. Eventually we became boyfriend and girlfriend. Um, and then things got serious. He gave me a promise ring before he uh, wanted to leave to Afghanistan. And so uh, we ended up being on different deployment cycles. And I didn't really know exactly what that meant. Um, when he deployed, one of my NCOs had told me like, hey, you're on different deployment cycles. So that means he's going to Afghanistan right now that we're coming back from Iraq. When he comes back, we're already going to be out in Iraq or we're going to be headed there. So you guys won't really see each other anymore. And so she's like, if you want to fix that, I recommend you get on the same deployment cycle. And I was like, well, how do I do that? She's like, volunteer to deploy. So All right. me being head over heels for this man, I volunteered to deploy to Afghanistan with their unit because a lot of girls were getting pregnant um, or other soldiers had gotten medical reasons like foot surgery or like knee surgery or something that caused them to not be able to deploy. They needed people. And so we did like swaps and whatnot. And so she knew somebody in my friend Logan's brigade who happened to be in her actual shop. So this is so cool. Um, so he was the NCIC for them and he helped me transfer over to their unit. So by my seventh month in the military, I was getting ready to deploy to Afghanistan. So Logan and them got pushed out a month before me. Um, I had to finish the rear G training and do all that. And then um, I got pushed out to Afghanistan in end of may 2009 wow yeah 2009 yeah so less than a year you're already getting ready to deploy that yeah. is crazy mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah so my seventh, seventh month yep yeah that's, that's 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 crazy that's crazy um 
So you mentioned that they went out before you. Is that correct? Yes. And then you went yes. out. Did you go out like a smaller group a little bit later? Yes. Mm -hmm. So we were okay. on uh, like their trail. So we have like main body, you know, all these different ones. And then you have trail, which is the last few of us going out there. And I ended up being on one of the last few flights. Okay. So. Okay. So, so with Afghanistan, um, what was your kind of mindset with going out there? I mean, I know you're going out there for, uh, for, a, for a gentleman, uh, but, uh, you know, you are going out to uh, essentially a war zone. Is there anything going through your mind as you're going through the training and, and getting prepared to, to head out there? It didn't hit me till I got on the plane. Honestly, oh. like I was like, OK, you know, training is not much different from what we were doing before. Like, you know, uh, and then I got on the plane and I'm like, holy shit, <laughs> I'm going to Afghanistan like this is real. <laughs> and uh, I had met some people in training. And so we were together in our row. And that, that was awesome because um, I had I wasn't by myself. You know, I had some support. Um but it was scary. I was like, okay, uh, I'm doing this. I said a prayer and we were on our way and we got to stop. We stopped in um, Ireland on the way and then ended up going to Kazakhstan, which okay. I had never yeah. heard of. I was like, uh, I don't know where I was mentally <laughs> in geography, but I never learned about this country. <laughs> uh, and then from there, we went to uh, Bagram. And, okay. so, and then from there, pushed out to our, our actual fobs. Got it, got it. And so uh, initially when you got to Afghanistan, um, first few weeks, months, what does it look like and, and how are you kind of like settling in, in in that in that area? So when I first got out there, it was, one, it was hot. <laughs> it was so hot. So I had to kind of get used to that. But I kind of grew up in Vegas too. So I was like, okay, yeah. you know, it's, it's not that much hotter than Vegas. It's a little bit hotter in Vegas. Um, the second thing was kind of getting used to seeing all the Afghanis and like their dress and how they interact with each other and um, the jingle trucks. I hated them damn <laughs> things. Oh my gosh, those things yeah. were the worst. They freak me out. Uh, and only because I heard so many like bad stories about them. And every time a jingle truck would go by, I'd like freeze up and be like, oh, like, you know, please don't blow up on me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like some things terrify before me. You, before you carry on, can you explain a, a jingle truck to people that are listening that may never have seen them? Okay. Uh, a jingle truck is like a huge dump truck. Y'all have dump trucks out there? Like trash, trash can trucks yeah, yeah. Type thing. Bin, so something bin, bin of that collector trucks <laughs> yeah something like that size but they have all these little hangy things on them that jingle like i want to i almost want to say something like uh similar to like a wind chime so they That's make right, those yeah. little noise and so as they're going by you just hear all these little wind chimes or these little noise jingling and they're so full of stuff that you can't tell like what's really on them. And I know like when they go through the fobs and all that stuff, they get checked, but like I've heard some stories. So I was always nervous. Like, did they really check this thing? Yeah. And those, those, <laughs> ding know? those dangly things, they, they go yeah. down to the ground pretty much, don't they? So, all the uh, way. Yes. It's uh, and they're so, colorful. They're like it's just, very colorful. they're just, yes. it's just weird. They're just weird. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's not something you see every day for sure. <laughs> So yeah, carry on with the, um, so you, you came out, you saw them and, uh, you were explaining how you, how you yes. kind of settled in. Um, also I realized that my fiance and I were nowhere near each other. So we thought when I let him know that I was going out there, he's like, Oh, you're too good for me. And all this other stuff. Like, cause I volunteered to go like, who the hell does that? But you know, <laughs> I did. <laughs> uh, and he was in the can like, Kando Ahar area and I was in the northeast in Jalalabad and so mm -hmm. he was not on Kandahar they were building cops and fobs below or around Kandahar um but we were nowhere near each other and so that kind of sucked but I you know said I'm out here and make the best of it I happen to be in the very same exact like office building everything as my best friend Logan we we're wow. on two different shifts but it was cool because we were in the same office so it was cool to like have her and know her and you know um, I threw myself into working out because there wasn't a whole lot to do, you know, after work or anything. So I did that and uh, I threw myself into my job. So I worked um, in the personal readiness management section of HR. So we were working with the medics and I tracked casualties when I got out there. 
Okay, okay. Yeah. So that must have been an eye-opener, right? Yes, that Mm -hmm. was uh, crazy, but it helped me mature a whole lot. Um, I grew up real quick in Afghanistan, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Was you was you nineteen at this point? I was still eighteen. You're still eighteen. Okay. Oh wait, so, no. You're right. I was nineteen at that you, point. Yeah. I had just turned nineteen. Had just turned nineteen. So yeah, quite a quite a wake up call. And and like you say, you you, you grew up quickly. Um, so once once you you know settled in, uh, acclimatized, I suppose, because you know you you gone from a, I guess a warm place of of America, but to an even hotter place on in the world, right? Not even because Colorado. Uh, sometimes you still get snow in those summer months it's really? insane like so we would still get snow in may yeah oh wow so okay. and then and okay. when it would get it's like a you get all four seasons in one day type of state so it was really weird uh <laughs> but then it would get really hot and the snow would melt and stuff but afghanistan was more like vegas yeah, <laughs> We're yeah. a little hotter than vegas but like a, yeah. like that you know very dry very ugh, hot <laughs> and so uh yeah how long was you out there as a whole? We'll come back to like individual things, but how long was you out there in Afghanistan as a, as a whole tour or, or a deployment? 12 months. So one 12 year. 12 months, one year. Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then how did it develop? So, you know, you, I mean, for someone new to the military, essentially being in less than a year uh, to then checking in casualties, that kind of stuff, that's, that's mental in itself. Um, yeah. But then, what what does the next few months look like, and uh, what can you share from from the first six months, maybe? It was very quick as far as uh, learning what I had to do. Um, so uh, I got a couple weeks of training, but it was very quick. And then I had my first experience with my first casualty, which happened to be someone who was killed in action. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. So when that happened, I was like, "Whoa!" Like this is real. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like it's no joke. And Mm -hmm. so, um, it hit me kind of hard and my NCO at the time kind of pulled me aside and was like, Hey, you got to have thick skin in this position. And I know you can do it. Um, it's sad. It sucks, but we got to drive on. And that was just it. That was our mentality. Yes. We lost somebody or yes, we had a casualty. Yes. Someone got extremely hurt, but you drive on, you do what you have to do. You get the mission done and you keep going. And so that was ingrained into my head immediately. Okay. Uh, and, and so we experienced a lot. <laughs> and so what, what was your job? You mentioned about the casualty aspect. So yeah. What, what, what does that look like for the, your role out there? Uh, can you share, so, share that? Yeah. So what I would do is I would work um, with people in the talk. I would work with the medics and then um, with our outlining units to get as much information from nine line medevacs uh, from the reports, anything like that, um, to get as much information and report those specific details, who it was, battle numbers, like uh, to ensure that the person was properly identified um, and then send it to hire and back in the States. And so when we would do that, we would get updates every so often. So maybe it might start with uh, someone social and the status of them, very seriously injured or uh, seriously injured, or they went to like the TMC or something, um, trying to not use acronyms, I'm sorry. Uh, They went to like go see the medic or something and then what they were seen for, right? Or if it was died of wounds or if it was killed in action or something like that, we'd have to track that. And so it would start sometimes very minimal information and then it would build up and you would just have this whole picture of what happened and the injuries that this person sustained. Mm -hmm. And then we would have to report all of that to hire. And then if the person, say they got um, evacuated to launch stool, I would still track them and track their progress as they were going based off the reports from like doctors or whoever would send us those reports on how they were doing. And then if they got stateside, track it all the way then. Once they got stateside, we were able to kind of not close it out, but close it out because they were back home. Does that make sense? Like Even if they're injuries, yeah, hand it over to beardy or whatnot and so um if not we had to track it all the way so they went back to the unit and we're back out on the line um so that's kind of how that went um and it was cool because i got to do something different that's not something that you do stateside 
or sure. at least that I've ever experienced stateside. Um, but it was also very sad. And yeah. I think the biggest one that hit me was Cop Keating. So I don't know if you've seen the movie The Outpost. Um, it's I a fairly new, fairly new uh, movie uh, that they made. And it's based on a true story that was my unit. Uh, basically, what had happened was uh, we had a unit stationed in a very terrible area in Afghanistan where it was almost like a bowl. So all the mountains were on the top and they were in the center of the bowl at the bottom. Like worst place that you can place soldiers. Um, and of course the enemy can see everything from the tops of the mountains around, right? Uh, basically that cop got overran uh, by the Taliban and their own Afghan National Army counterparts kind of turned on them. Okay. Um, and so that day, uh, I believe it was October 3rd, of uh, that morning, we got an influx of all the reports and it started with like two or three, right? Then it went from two or three to like six, seven, eight, and it kept going and kept going. I think there was 27 casualties that day, if I can remember correctly. Um, not all of them were killed in action, but there was a, a good handful that were. There was one that died of wounds. Uh, but the, in total, there was 27 casualties all from this one incident. It was insane. Wow. And we were trying to get them help. And you can hear, like, I'm in the talk. You're hearing all the stuff that's going on. You can see certain things on, like, the uh, – we have, like, in the talk this huge screen um, – where they have like, I don't know where they have the cameras. I don't know if they're on like drones on like planes or something, but you can see certain things, right? Um, and then we're running back and forth with the medics. That that was like the worst one for me. Um, their whole camp was completely destroyed. Like everything they had was destroyed. And so after all of that took place, they asked for like donations from anybody. So like me and Logan, some other NCOs in our shop, we went and go, we went and bought like PTs because we had this small little tiny shop at, which was basically like a, um, a made up building. It wasn't even like a real building. It was like a, a little thing that they kind of put stuff in and sold out of. Right. But we went and we bought them a bunch of stuff just to help them out. Like it was, it was heartbreaking reading and hearing and seeing all the stuff that was going on and there was nothing we can do for them. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. So, so yeah, that sounds like a, 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 a I suppose a really important point. Um, being out there and trying to help those individuals uh and do do you was you part of the team that would help support maybe families back at home or is that something that the state side would kind of like deal with um with keeping their families up to date i believe that was actually our chief i oh, think really? she was the one who wrote all the like condolences letters and all of that okay. so we had that out there but it was someone else who who did that Okay. So, and so uh, at this point, are you still? Uh, what rank are you, in fact, at this point? I think I was a PFC at that point, so private oh, first class. Private first class. Okay. Um, so that's that's a lot. That's a lot to take on as a as a private first class, uh, and it's just mental that this is all happening in your kind of like first year, year and a half of being in the military. Um, mm -hmm. And did you did you leave the main base at any point, or was was you stationed there for the, for the whole twelve months? So we left twice. So I went to three different FOBs. So on the way in, I got to stop at FOB Matterlong, which was a small little place, um, not too far from Jalalabad. But we were only there for like thirty minutes, so that was you know just on the way. Um, I got to leave for a day to FOB Binley Shields, which wasn't too far away. Um, but I got to go there for a day with my NCO and we did like a little award ceremony and whatnot and got connected with their S1. Um, and then before we left, I got placed in Bagram with Logan as we were pushing people out. But up okay. until that time, we were mostly on FOB Fenty, which is in Jalalabad. Right, right, right. And just for anybody that is listening, FOB, if is the same as the Brits, is forward operating base. Yes. Sweet. Yes. So we do have some uh, similarity there. So that's good. <laughs> yeah. There was actually Britons out there and Canadians. And I think like the French army was out there too. And I think the Polish too. It was kind of cool. There was so many different counterparts out there with us. Yeah. And did so, you get to 
communicate much with with the other nations? Um, not a whole lot. In Bagram, we got to communicate a little bit more with them, um, like in passing though. Um, but as far as like working with them, us in particular, like we didn't really get to. Fair so. enough. Fair enough. Uh, so did anything like uh, positive happen uh, alongside obviously all that difficult part of, uh, of of being out there with with the casualties and stuff but was there any p- positives that you could take from from your your time in afghan uh the cinnamon naan was good <laughs> what, <laughs> like what the is that food, their cultures to get to know that you never uh had okay so out there they have uh naan which is like this flatbread right okay and yeah, then yeah, in certain bread, places yeah. Uh, or across the fall, there was a place where they had like cinnamon naan. So that place was good. But we rarely got that. I think we only had that like twice while we were out there. Um, I got to be part of a shura, which was a big one for our uh, brigade commander. He invited people and it was pretty cool getting to sit with them and like drink tea. It was chai, which was the best chai tea I've ever had out there. <laughs> uh, and like fruits and like meat and rice. And it was it was pretty good. Um so that was cool. And then just, I guess, getting to know my job and um, building friendships because I've made some friendships out there that they're going to be in my life forever. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like mm-hmm. you you get really, you um, really close to people out there because of all the experiences that bring you together. So that was pretty cool. Um, and I guess it was see. cool that you're out there with Logan, right? Because you've gone through yes. all the training and stuff and now you're on your first deployment together. That's 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 crazy. That doesn't happen much. Yeah, no. So she was another person I consider to be my angel because shortly after that, so I was really scared after Cop Keating um, and I asked my fiance, like, please be careful because it started to get really real. And um, come February, we were planning on going on leave together in the beginning of March. I want to say it was like the first week of March or something like that. So we had like two weeks left uh, before we were supposed to go on R&R, which was leave, uh, mid-deployment leave. And ours was like a little bit past mid-deployment, but we're like trying to go together so I could meet his family in Texas. Um, But unfortunately, he was killed in action on uh, February 13th of 2010 and so I was so thankful that I had Logan there with me because she kind of knew us um, from before she of course she knew me but she knew like our relationship and everything from beforehand all the way through deployment and then till that moment when all hell broke loose and Mm -hmm. it just got really crazy and real out there everything changed so big time big time in your life um how did you cope out there how did you get the news and you can share as much or as little as you want this is your episode yeah so uh i'm sorry if i get a little emotional when i go into the detail i could talk about it but then when i start getting into the details it, it hits hard uh I got moved from casualties to awards, uh, I want to say around January. So it was like right before everything happened. Um, we had a soldier from Rear D come forward. She was a specialist. Um, so she kind of outranked me and they placed her in my old position and I got placed into awards. Um, and I, I kind of thank God for that because I don't know how much worse I would have reacted had I read his report, like okay. come across and like be the one to actually receive it. But that, that day, um, it was morning. I worked a swing shift. So when I started working for awards, my shift changed. So I worked from midnight to noon. Um, and it was in the morning sometime. I remember the reports came in and my former, uh, coworker, former NCO, her name was Sergeant Lamping. She received the report and kind of like looked at me like, oh shit. Like that's, that's the best way I can explain her facial expression. Like, oh shit. Yeah. Uh, and she caught my attention immediately. I knew something was wrong and she pulled, um, three red folders and I think like two blue ones. So a red folder meant a soldier was very seriously injured and in critical condition or killed in action or died of wounds. Okay. 
a blue folder meant they could be seriously injured or it was a uh, routine. So something where they were seen for something, but they could get sent back the same day. So uh, I started like praying in my head, please be a blue folder, please be a blue folder. Um, but nothing was said. And so I seen her walk into the major's office and they're talking. And it's weird because being that I worked casualties, I know that you only tell certain people certain things. You cannot tell anybody, like, it doesn't matter if you're working person next to you or whatever, until the families are notified, you do not tell anybody. So it was like the commander knew, our major knew, and I think like star major knew, and then us, our team, that's it. No one else, like, so awards wouldn't know, promotions wouldn't know. Anybody else in our shop who did anything other than casualties would not know who it was. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, so she went and told the major and I'm like freaking myself out in my head, fighting my thoughts. So I'm starting to build tears. And back then in the army, that's a huge no, no. Like you don't show emotion. You are supposed to be just, you know, straight faced and, and handle it and drive on. That was what was instilled into me, but I'm freaking out because this is somebody that I love and I know he's some kind of casualty because she wouldn't have looked at me otherwise. Um, so I went out, uh, I grabbed a bottle of water. When I come back in, she's talking to my direct line NCO who has nothing to do with casualties. And when I walked back in, they both kind of just looked up and stopped uh, talking. <laughs> like you couldn't be more obvious, you know okay. what I mean? So I knew, okay, we're something's going on here. Especially because she talked to Sergeant Tejeda who was my NCO at the time. And I was like, that's, that's not normal. That doesn't yeah. usually happen. So uh, again, I'm sitting there, I'm listening to music. You're not really supposed to listen to music, but I did. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to clear my mind, trying to work on these stupid awards and like get my mind off of it. But I know something's wrong and I could feel something's wrong in my body. So it got to the point where like tears were literally about to drop. And I was like, okay, I, I got to get myself together. So I walked out into the bathroom um, and I, like washed my face to get the tears off and like, talk to myself in the mirrors like get your shit together you're okay you got this everything's gonna be okay and so I go back in and it's like almost I don't know if the whole shop knew but it's like everybody knew because everybody looked at me like it's like they stopped and they looked in looked at me while I came in and it was one of those moments where everybody's looking at you like I'm so sorry like they're heartbroken and uh, <laughs> Oh, uh, I'm trying not to cry. Uh, I knew something was really wrong. I just didn't know what it was. And so I'm texting Logan. We have these little Afghani phones. They're like the little Nokia's where it's just like a face phone and like push button phone. Little so old school we all things, had yeah. those. <laughs> yeah, we had those. Uh, so I texted Logan. I was like, Logan, something's really wrong. I don't know what it is, but I think Bobby's a casualty. And she was just like, oh, no, don't think like that. You're okay. Well, in the background, like I didn't know this happened until like very recently. She told me um, she'd been carrying guilt for all these years. I guess they called her and were like, hey, uh, Pagan's a casualty. His last name was Pagan. Uh, he's a casualty. I need you to come in because she came in earlier than her normal time. She's like, uh, they told her, I need you to come in and distract Soriano until we figure out what to do which I had no clue. And so they didn't tell her like the details, but they said like, Hey, he is a casualty. We need her distracted. So she comes in and I'm about to get off. And typically I would go eat lunch, which was my dinner because that was, I was a swing shift and then I would go work out, but I, I couldn't eat. I was just so stressed and like, so I felt something wrong. I was anxious. And so we went in and I'm trying not to break down in this defect. And I'm telling her like, I don't know what's wrong. Something's really wrong. I could feel it. And she's like, stay positive. Everything's going to be okay. And she called me Soriano. She's like, don't think like that Soriano. And Logan never calls me Soriano. It's very, very rare. Um, she'll either call me Diana, which is also rare, or Reno. She always calls me Reno. That's her term of endearment for me. And so when she called me Soriano, it something clicked in me where I was like, that's not normal. Why are you calling me Soriano? And that's probably not something that she like thought to herself would would stand out to me, but it did. And that's how like minimal that she calls me that. And so I'm like, something's really wrong. So we finish. Uh, she goes back into the office. I go to my room and I change into my PT um, workout uniform. And then I'm looking at his pictures. I had his pictures posted on my wall, like 
taped to my wall. Um, it was like concrete or something (laughs) or something like that. So, uh, I remember it was taped to the wall and I started like, praying and I was talking to myself out loud and I was like okay Diana you like you can't think like this he's gonna be okay everything's gonna be okay he promised me he would come home he promised me and so um I was like okay I'm gonna I'm gonna go work out and then I got a knock on my door (sighs) when uh I opened the door it was my direct line NCO Sergeant Tejeda and she just looked at me like she had the face just to you're a soldier, straightforward face, no emotion, very serious. Hey, they need you at the office. And I was just like, do you know why? And she's trying to avoid eye contact. She's looking everywhere else but my eyes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, she just said, uh, no, I don't. And so I locked eyes with her. I kind of made her look at me. And I pleaded with her. And I was just like, sorry, Tejeda, please, do you know anything? Uh, are you sure? And she straightened her face again. I could tell she was fighting it. And uh, and I don't blame her. Uh, but she just looked straight forward away from me. And she's like, I'm sure. And I was just like, okay, so what else am I going to do? And so we, we walked back to the office. And the office wasn't far away at all. It was literally down the road. Um, but it felt like it was a three-mile walk. And my body was extremely heavy. I I felt it in my my soul I guess you could say that something was extremely wrong but I had hope because they let me leave work without telling me anything so I'm like okay maybe he's hurt but it's not as bad as I'm thinking it is or maybe like in my head I was thinking he lost a limb or something like something that critical right I was my my head did not go to where he's dead I I just didn't. I was just thinking like he's in critical condition, like something's really wrong, but I did I thought he was still alive. Um and so we're we're going there, she opens up, she puts a code into the talk, she opens up the building and it's almost like corridors. So when you first go in, we're in the back corridor, you have to go to the right and then left and then our office would be there's a few hallways in between and our office would be on the right-hand side. Um in the front corridor. Uh so we go and we're walking through the corridor and I seen in Sergeant Major's hallway, my NCYC Sergeant Ocampo standing outside of his office. And he kind of, so Sergeant Tejeda like veered me towards him. So I knew I was going towards him. Um, and he kind of just stood there and I, I didn't know what to say. So I just said his name. I was like Sergeant Ocampo. And he just pointed to the room or office that was across from the Sergeant Major's office. And the room didn't have anything in it, but like a couch, uh, like a leather couch and a table with like two chairs. Um, and they were like fold out, fold out chairs. And so he points me into the room and in there, my major was sitting on the couch. Uh, and he walks in behind me and they have me like sit on this fold out chair facing the door. And uh, the Sergeant Major, Sergeant Major Sasser came in with our chaplain, Chaplain Madge. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's never good. And so um, I'm sitting there. I'm starting to shake. Like, my chest is super tight. At that point, I couldn't fight the tears anymore. I'm silently crying, but tears are kind of coming down my cheeks. And I'm trying to, like, wipe myself and get myself together. And my Sergeant Major comes up to me and my hands were on my lap and he grabs my hand and he puts it on the table and he's just holding it. And he's like, um, Soriano is specialist, Bobby, Justin Pagan, your fiance. And at this point I'm fighting through the tears. Like my voice is cracking, like it, everything's so dry. And I was like, yes, Sergeant Major. And, uh, and he says, um, I'm sorry to inform you, but specialist Bobby Justin Pagan was killed in action while out on patrol this morning. And I shut down. Like I uh, screamed at the top of my lungs. I screamed no at the top of my lungs. And I just blacked out for a second. Like his whole sentence got cut off. Like my mind just went completely blank and everything just kind of got black for a second. 
And I just remember screaming and crying. And then at that point, the couch was on my left. So I, I remember turning to Sarno Campo and I grabbed him and I was just like, Sarno Campo, like begging him, please no. And he just like had tears welling up in his eyes, but he just kind of hugged me and didn't say anything. And um, at that point, it's like the whole room. Like, so the chaplain, the Sarno major and my major kind of got up and was like coming towards me. Like, I think they wanted to embrace me, but I, I just, wasn't having it in that moment so I was like no like I want Logan and so Sarno Campo had ran out um to go get Logan because our office was right around the corner and um he grabbed her and I'm sitting there crying like please god like why is this happening and um she comes running in with her arms just like wide open ready to embrace me and I jumped up from that chair and I just screamed and got in and embraced her and cried into her chest and I was like Logan they killed my baby like why they killed my baby and she's just like hugging me and she's like I know sorry I know everything's gonna be okay and I was just screaming no and just crying and crying um it was really terrible I just I didn't know what to do. I wasn't expecting that at all. I, I was expecting them to tell me like he couldn't walk again or he lost an arm or or something, anything. But I was not expecting them to tell me he was killed in action. Mm -hmm. And so after I calmed down, uh, the star major let me know, hey, we're going to treat it as if you guys were married, which I didn't know was not typically protocol. Okay. But I was extremely thankful that they did. Um, so they sent me home, being that I was about to go on R and R, but they allowed me to take emergency leave for him too, even though we weren't married, um, so that I could go home and bury him. So instead of going to meet his family with him, I went to meet his family to bury him. Mm. And that was extremely, extremely difficult. Mm. 